is Pam Morris. I'm calling you from the Corsound Waterfowl Museum in Harkers Island, North Carolina. I, I know I've been expecting your call. Well, I have had the most equipment <laughs> trouble you've ever heard of in your life this afternoon. <laughs> Trying to get something because I can't write very fast. And I'm like, I know that I must surely have a machine here that works out of these three that I've got. So, it's taken me a little bit just to... Wait, 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 I'm having a little phone problem. Let me get a straight. Okay. Can you hear me all right now? I can hear you just fine. Well, I, I, I'm not hearing you real good. You might have to, you might have to talk, talk a little bit louder. Okay. Um... I'll try to turn my phone up too. I've got it on set on a speaker so that I can record what's being said so I can remember what I've said later on. <laughs> well, more importantly, what you're going to say. But um, I've been talking with Alan Willard from Beaufort. And he's been telling us about the, um, the I guess, wreck of the Menhaden boat, the Fenwick Island. I remember the Fennec Island very well. Well, that's why we were calling you um, to see, you know, if we could get a little bit more information about it. And if you don't mind if I uh, record the interview, uh, I, you know, is that okay with you? Or That will be just fine. All right. Well, um, if I could, uh, let me just ask you a little bit about, you know, what's your back, you know, where do you live and your name and how old you are and all that sort of good stuff. Uh, uh, wait one second. Ellen, turn that TV down, please. I get away and turn the TV down. <laughs> okay. All right, well, uh, and how you want me to give you the rundown on me? Yeah, well, I like the rundown on you, if you don't mind. Well, my name is Henry Dixon. I live in Whitestone, Virginia. I've been a Manhattan fisherman all my life. I am uh, 76 years old, and I've been Manhattan fishing ever since 1952. And I live at uh, 2214 Ockren Road, O-C-R-A-N, Ockren Road, Whitestone, 22578. All right. Well, um, can you uh, just tell us for background information a little bit about what you what was your job or various drop jobs in the Menhaden business? Well, I started fishing in 1952, working in the first boats, pulling the net by hand on a boat named the W.R. Row. And I stayed on that, and uh, my brother got to be captain of a boat. And I rode the dry boat for him the following summer. That fall, I went mate with him in Beaufort. The next year, I come up here and I went mate with a boy named Thomas Summers on a boat named Elizabeth M. Froelich. I stayed mate with him one year, and the next year, I got a captain's job on a boat named the Ocean Springs. A little teeny old boat, she just carried 350,000. And uh, that fall I was in Beaufort on the Humphreys Brothers with uh, Captain Alden Abbott. I went to meet with him that fall. And the factory down there at Lennoxville caught a fire and burned up. And they had a lot of the machinery out of the Whitestone factory here. So they tied the boat up that I was fishing, and they sent me down to Morris Point, Mississippi. And I stayed down there for eight seasons. And then I came back up here, and I went aboard a boat named the Brunswick. And that was in uh, 1969. Or 1970. I can't, can't keep my date straight anymore. And I was fishing her. I was captain of her. 
the night that the Frederick Island went down. I faced the, the, the Brunswick that summer, and that night, well, I got ahead of myself a little bit. We was a, didn't have many fish that fall, and then a body of fish showed up about six or seven miles off a of Hatteras village. And I was one of the fortunate ones. I got up there on a Friday and got a load of fish and was one of the first boats back to the factory at Beaufort at Lennoxville. And I got back up there Saturday morning. And the ones that couldn't get up there from fishing up there Friday, they was all tied up at the factory with loads of fish and got it, some of them got in fishing, went down on the uh, Atlantic Beach side of both of them and did a little fishing. And uh, I was back up there where the body of fish was and I got me another load of fish. I was very, very fortunate. I was with the first boat to load up there. And I started coming down, and it was slick cam, or calm. Or, if you don't mind, I'll call it cam. Yeah, that's what we call it, too. Anyhow, when I come across both of by both of sea blue, running down to the lookout knuckle, it was just like a mirror on the water, except for it started getting some swirls out of the southwest coming, and a big, heavy cloud line was coming up the beach. And we got by the lookout knuckle there for or the lookout sea buoy. Not the lookout, but the Ocracoke sea buoy. About 45 minutes or an hour. And I, t I told uh, my mate, I said, Lord, go down and get the men just as soon as they get through eating and get a smoke. Everybody smoked in. I said, and get the men out of the boat and get everything ready for a bad night. And we had that old boat loaded with everything we could put on. By the time we got down to Drum Inlet, it was a sea there, I guess, four or five foot high. And the wind was steady kindling up. It was steady getting rougher right along pretty fast. By the time from Drum Inlet to we got to the lookout knuckle, we could not haul to go into Beaufort. We had to keep going on out in the ocean. It was so rough then that we, I was scared to turn the boat sideways and put that sea on our side. We had them all boarded up with deck boards. And I had called the other boats behind me, which was the most of them was anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours behind me. And I was telling them how bad it was getting. And they thought I was just running on a bunch of stuff with them until they ran into that wind. Then they found out how bad it was. But anyhow, we got on going on down there, and it was a boat named the uh, Eglin Bay, another mine sweeper. And he had been fishing up there all day long, and he hadn't caught no fish, he had a light boat. And he was the closest boat behind me. And when he got to the knuckle buoy, he hauled on in there for to go in both the bar, or Mohead City bar, whatever you want to call it. And when he was going in there, I told my pilot, I said, now, Roland, I says, uh, when that boat gets in there to the sea buoy, we're going to put the sea in her stern and haul right straight for him. And he, uh, he said, that'd be fine with that stir, this big sea on our stern then. I said, that's right. Well, he slacked his first boats all up, and they was all loose, and he had to come around stern too and get them tightened up, so on and so forth. And we thought he was at the sea pool, and we picked out chances in between the big seas and hauled around and got a bearing on him and started on in there. Well, we missed going into both with Bob about two or three miles. We was up at the Wheel Creek on the corner beach. But anyhow, we was going in there and uh, Ron said, well, what do you want to do now, Captain? I said, well, well it's this bad and tell me you're making that all right. You keep doing what you've been doing. I said, well, we'll tackle back on shore 
then we'll pick out Kansas and turn on again and go right into ball. Well, we had a man on one of the boats named Captain <coughs> Ernest Delana, not Ernest Delana, Captain Ernest Ashburn. And he called me and said, Henry, y'all don't have no wind. Said, we got a hundred mile now in here. And I says, boats is breaking all loose from the dock. Fifty gallon drums are flying through the air like tin cans. Mm. So in that we turned the boat right there. I, I said, hit her right in the bar right now, Rowan. And when we did that, we got squared up to go in the bar. My mate, he was watching the cap boat on one side. I was watching the main boat and working the throttles on the other side, and my pilot was turned on. Mm. And my mate says, uh, Henry said, we just lost the cap boat. I said, well, you better get in your life jacket, because if you have, we'd have lost them. She was smothered right up there. It was blowing so hard that it blew the radio antennas down, and they got hung up in the, ra uh, the radar antenna. Mm. And that wound up in the radar antenna, and that stopped the radar. Wow. And all the boats behind me were out there. I could hear them talking, but I couldn't talk to them. I didn't have no more radios. Uh, the antennas was all just wound all up. And uh, that's when that gale of wind cut my offshore there, and the rest of them was hauling, running on down that south west so they could... Uh, Hall to come in the open bar too. That's when that wind hit the Pacific Island and blew her over. Uh, she was back loaded too. Mm. And uh, when she rolled over, she rolled over on her side, and the W.T. James, that's one of the, well, at that time it was one of the Haney boats, and a man named Ernest Ashburn, er, no, Ernest Delano, was fishing her. He was the captain of them. He hadn't caught any fish up there that side either. And it had a couple of the crew members, the engineer, the captain, and the mate hanging on the rolling chocks on the Pentagon Island. And he put the spotlight on them. He could see them part of the time. And he ran to W.T. James right up on top of that boat. And by lucky, they had a ladder on those boats that went over the side and went down to the water. And uh, those men climbed up that ladder, got aboard that boat, and uh, the W.T. James was on top of them. But then it was a horrible stormy night. I would say if I had to estimate it, I would say we had seas 15 to 20 foot high. Wow. It was an awful time. And... Uh, we came in the next day, we was tied up to the dock and uh, Standard Products owned the factory up in uh, Moorhead there. Yeah. Right on the other side of the Moorhead Bridge, uh, I think it used to be the old George Wallace factory. I might be wrong on that. But anyhow, they called, sent somebody down there and told me I could go up there and get my fish out. So I went on up there. And we got unloaded and had broke the boards that we had on the side of the steamer to, to keep where we would put fish down on the deck load. And they were broke right half in two. And how they stayed on her, I'll never know. Hmm. But we come on back, and we was tied back up in both of them at Harold Simpson's dock, where we fueled at. And the Shirula was coming in. That was the big Coast Guard cover from over at the Coast Guard station. And she was towing one fish boat, and she had eight crew members off of the Pentagon Island on her that had uh, fallen on to the great fishermen up in the heavens. Mm. But anyhow, uh, that's when I really did get nervous. It, uh, I guess you could call it and I got scared. Yeah. I turned around and I said to my mate, I said, Lloyd, do you want to go home? He said, well, Captain, he said, whatever you do, that's what I'm going to do. I said, good. He 
stayed in my truck and let's go home. And that's what we did. We came home that Sunday night, stayed until Monday, and went back down that Monday and feast the rest of the season. Wow. Is there anything else you would like for me to tell you about it? Well, um, about how many boats all together? I've heard that it. it was several boats. Which, which exactly boats was it? Uh, Menhagen boats was it fishing that day off of Hatteras? Oh, it was quite a few. We had the W.T. James and we had the, uh, oh, I can't even remember, but there was the Haney Mines, we were the Bucket Deal was fishing, and then we had the Ingram Bay up there fishing. It was, I, I, I would say it was a good dozen boats up there fishing. I, I, it would take me a little while to, to remember and get all the names together. The, the Weems was up there fishing. The John M. Moorhead was up there fishing. It, it, it was quite a few boats up there. And uh, it, it, they, they, they all got in but the Thunder Island, and there was a, it, it retired some fish boat captains from fishing. Did it really? It sure did. And I'm being retired of them. Wow. But it was, a, we had a lot of boats at the dock and had fish that hadn't got unloaded to get up there. And we had them that was up there fishing. Yeah. When the Coast Guard um, came there to them, did the Coast Guard come there to the Fenwick Island? Did you see them come up there to her? I, I think the only thing she had done, she had rolled over and sunk. And when she sank, it went back down. She sat right on the bottom and she sat right up and of course all those old Smith boats had them great long masts to them. Right. A little bit of her mast was still sticking under the water down there below the uh, lookout knuckle. I got you. They have, a, they have a buoy on her now that is known as the Pacific Island buoy. I see. Okay. So uh, in the beginning, it, you know, it did have the mast was stuck out the water so you knew where she was anyway. It wasn't much, but I, I think about Five or six feet of our mast was sitting out of the water the next day. Yeah. And it, what the seas were still plenty big then, but they, it was blowing down all the time. You could see it, you know. Right. About what time of night was it did she go down? I would say when she went down, it was probably around 8.30 or 9 o'clock. I see. At night. Right. I don't, I don't know exactly, but I would estimate it was around that time. Yeah. And the the captain, how many crew members did the, um, what was the name of the boat that picked up the people? I can't remember. I'm looking at some papers. What was the name of the boat that their captain went over there on top of that boat and got the survivors? Wow. The, 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 the captain of that was Captain Ernest Delana. And he was fishing uh, one of these, uh, well, they, they still got some of them up here on the bay that fishes that look, look just like she looked. Uh, she was one of these little coastal freighters that in the Second World War that they had converted and made into a fish boat. Right. And, and he, he was the captain of her. Uh, she was a little bit, she was, in fact, she was quite, she's 165 foot is what she is. Uh-huh. And... Uh, the captain of the Frederick Island was a, a black captain named Captain Charlie Lee Forrest. I see. Did they did they rescue him too? Did they do what now? Did, did he survive or or and was he's still living? Yeah. Okay. I, th I think him and his chief engineer are the only two that's still living that was aboard that boat. I see. I think everybody else has passed on. Did he continue to fish afterwards? Yes, 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 he did. He never came back to Beaufort again, but he fished down in the Gulf for the rest of his fishing career down in Morgan City. I see. Does he live down? Does he live down there? Or live in Virginia? No, he lives over here in Matthews County. I see. Back where he was, what, what weren't weren't they from that area? Yes, he was originally place? from Matthews County. Yeah. And he still lives over there. Mm -hmm. uh, he lives right below the 
Okay, and that's where some of his crew live too. Is that right? Thank you, pardon. That is—is is that where some of the crew also came from? Was that their name? Yeah. Oh yeah, I would say ninety uh, percent of his crew came from over there. Uh huh. And uh, and stuff. They fish with him in Louisiana and came up here that fall. Fish with him that fall up here. Yeah. Well, how did? I wonder how it was that they were able to get on that ladder. Is that is a ladder something that normally you would find on the side of a yeah, menhaden? On, on, on those little uh, coastal freighters that they converted into fish boats, every one of them had a ladder on the side of the boat. Uh-huh. And they had hooks on the side of the boat. And they had them on the seas 15 and 20 feet that will be hard oh yeah i know i know it was yeah but they did it but they, they had one man that was a crew member who got up there and just as soon as he got on deck he took both his arms and went and died right there wow he had them stand right to death good he God. climbed up that ladder got on deck on the WT James and had a heart attack right on the deck. Oh my goodness. Wow. Well, for the, what, about what time was it if a Coast Guard was towing somebody else in, did you say that they, he, they had the, they had been able to get some of the bodies from the well, well, Coast Guard, let me tell you something, most of them get the Coast Guard help, but uh, I don't have nothing but something good to say about them. They got underway that Saturday night when they got the call, I think, because they didn't have no crews aboard them, you know, they just had the regular men standing to watch. But I think they got underway in a matter of about two and a half or three hours and was at sea. And the next morning, when it, when it, it broke daylight, because the sea was getting blown down then and all that stuff, you know. It wasn't like it was when the boat sank. He, uh, they, these men were all floating out there in their life jackets. And they started picking them up. Wow. And that, I don't know whether you remember the uh, big coast guard cutter they had there named the Shalua or not. Yeah, I didn't remember her. Well, she was a right big boat. I imagine she was 200 some feet long, but she was a, she was a big boat. But anyhow, they, they, they did a good job, and of course, uh, the Williams was coming down there. He lost both of his main engines with dirty fuel, running out of fuel folders. Didn't have a very good engineer board, tried to run the boat, but there were no fuel folders, and then all the injectors stopped up, and he just had laid out there and drifted. And they got him, and was bringing him in, I guess, I would say we had unloaded out the fish then, and they come back down to Beaufort. I would say it was a, probably about 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the evening when they was coming in the harbor there at Beaufort in Moorhead City. Okay. Well, that must have been quite a night, I'll tell you that. It's the kind of night when you're on an old rotten man egg boat. <laughs> that makes you sit down and want to hide. <laughs> makes you, makes you. It made me want to. It made a whole lot more of want to. Well, it sounds like to me they wandered themselves right off of the boat. Some of them did. Yeah. Some of them did. Some of them. I had a man when the, I told him to make to go down there and get the men out of the boats was standing up on the bow. And he's still fishing right now. He's an old, old man. 
And he looked back up on the bridge at me and says, uh, What's the matter, Captain? You're getting scared? His name is Clifton Henry. Lives up there in Whitestone. And every time I see him, I says, uh, What's the matter, Clifton? You're getting scared? And he breaks his laugh. <laughs> it just feels like I'm to the dock. He had his clothes back and he quit for the rest of the season. <laughs> Well, I can't say that I blame him for that. No, well, it, it, it was all of them, uh, a lot of them, it was quite a few of them on all the boats. They did quit for the rest of the season. Yeah. Well, see, she obviously fished not only here, but in many other areas of the country. Um, did you find fishing out of Beaufort more dangerous or less dangerous or about the same as the other ports you fished out of? Well, everybody, <laughs> when you fish out of the boat in North Carolina, you're all right until you go around that, on that east beach, and everybody hates to go around now. Because in them, you know, we didn't have nothing to get the weather report like they do aboard these boats now. They they have good, good radio communications with the weather stations and everything else now which we didn't have at that time. All we had was a company radio and a, and a CP, and that was it. Yeah, did you have radar, you say? Yes, we did have a radar. Uh, yeah, it, not, not everybody had one of those, but I didn't have one on the boat I was on. Yeah. Well, that... I wasn't worth that had all the antennas down in it. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to use a radio with no antenna, that's for sure. That's right, and, and it's hard to use a radar when you when it's they come to a stop up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it has so many radar uh, antennas wrapped around the radar antenna that it, it, it stopped it. <laughs> oh my goodness! Wow. So you would say probably right offhand it was blowing a hundred mile an hour that night, right? Well, it blew those antennas right right get them down enough that that. Radar antenna wrapped them around it. Yeah. Throw them down into that. Goodness gracious. I can't imagine. Yeah, well, that, was a, that was a stormy night. Yeah, it sounds like it. We've had we've had a lot of, well, it seems like a lot here around North Carolina from time to time. We'll have losses like that, I'm sorry to say, but maybe that's the case for everybody. Most nature of the business, I suppose. Well, I always heard when you went to North Carolina, don't be scared of North Carolina and have a lot of respect for it. <laughs> yeah. And that, that holds true. Well, I think you're right. All right, you, Mr. Dixon, I think that about covers it. Is there anything else you want to tell me or whatnot about the Finley well, Island do, or fishing? Uh, sit down and tell you about that would probably take two hours. <laughs> well, I have a lot of time, so... <laughs> Uh, now, who did you say that y'all was getting all this together for now? Well, we've actually, I work at a little museum in Harker's Island. Oh, in Harker's Island? Yes, sir. That's located uh, east of Beaufort. Then. Yep. We're down here east of Beaufort. Yeah, I know where it's at. Yep. And we have uh, been conducting, not myself, but uh, a uh, person that we work with here, has been conducting a lot of interviews about the menhaden industry right. over the last year. And we sort of uh, had a culmination of all that research that was done. They did a lot of photography with that. And we had a big event down here uh, last Saturday. And we had, uh, you know, because unfortunately North Carolina doesn't have a menhaden plant anymore. Oh, and, nice. Yeah, and Beaufort Fisheries had closed five years ago this year, and we wanted to do something to remember the menhaden industry by. So on Saturday, we had uh, posters made up with, uh, like, different jobs uh, that you would have on a menhaden boat. Like, uh, we had a poster and then a quote and then a, uh, uh, I mean, a picture and a quote and a job title. And what the person did if they had that job, like the cat, we had the captain and the ringsetter 
and the bump puller and the same house, you know, so yeah, I worked in the same house. Right. Uh, during the day, yeah. it, we had um, like round table, we had a captain's round table and we had uh, people who worked at the factory, they spoke and we had a history, a historian that gave the history of the Menhaden industry in the our state and uh, we had a biologist that gave you know a talk about the life cycles of Menhaden and then uh, we ended the day with uh, the North Carolina Shantyman and they sang you know I think there's two of them that actually or three of them actually that left left that actually pulled nets by hand and sang the shanties and they've got uh, some other people that have joined up with them that are sort of carrying that tradition on. So they sang at the end of the day. And, and I must say, it, it was really wonderful. Well, you know, when I found out y'all was having that, was last Friday night at 9 o'clock. Well, that's, well, I'll tell you one thing, uh, Mr. Dixon. You would certainly have enjoyed it. Well, I'm going to tell you one thing. There's a whole lot of people up here that would have came down there for that. I know. We had one lady. Uh, her husband used to run the uh, boat, the Reedville. His name was Teeny. I don't Teeny know. Teeny Dill. Yep. And, I uh, well. Yep. And his wife, Catherine, uh, came down and she brought some pictures and, uh, you know, was there with her things and talked about her husband and all. And uh, she had as fine a time as anybody. And uh, Catherine, yeah, Catherine Deal, I know. Yep. I, I knew him very well. Yep. And uh, it, it's kind of funny. The fellow that runs Revel now. Oh, it might a deal. Well, he's actually the person is from Carter County now. That is the captain of that boat. And of Reedville. Yes, the Reedville. Oh, yeah, Al, 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 Al Dudley. Yeah, Al Dip, Captain Al Dudley. And um, anyway, she had never met Al. And of course, Al's as fine a person as anybody would want to meet. And a good captain. And yeah, so, oh, yeah. Yep, and so she was able to meet him, and I think she was real pleased about that, too. So, but we did, Mr. we had the best time, and it was... I don't know. It was really moving for me, and and I didn't have anybody in that industry. My family had fished for a long time in other commercial pursuits, but no, nobody did I have in the Manhattan industry. But I tell you this: I learned the most and just enjoyed it the most of any program I believe we've ever had here. Well, if y'all ever get it together again, and I know it was the fifth year to celebrate the closing of that plant, you know, to show them a little stuff. But if you ever get it again, see if you can't get the word up there, at least three or four weeks ahead of time, and you would have lots of people from this area to come down there. Well, we certainly will. We, I know that we'll have it again, and it probably won't be five years. It'll be sooner than any five years, so. But if, when we do, I now have your number, and I'll get up with you. And you could come down because it really was. It was a good thing. I was glad we had it. So. Well, you, you do that. You get a hold of me. And I'll get it in the grapevine up here and, and, and get it around. And you tell one, one will tell another, you know, and stuff yeah. like that. That's right. Exactly. And uh, and I know that will be, I wouldn't say all of them would come, but it would be a lot of them that would come. Yes, that's right. Well, I certainly do look forward to that, and I'll definitely call you and get up with you. All right, man. I certainly enjoy talking to you. Well, me too, and thank you for uh, talking with us. We really appreciate that. Well, like I said, you know, it's hard for me to talk on the telephone, but to sit down and talk to you, I could have really did it. Yep, yeah, that's All right. right. Man, I'm going to let you go. Okay. Is there anything that uh, you want me to... Tell you about if you go and listen to that again or talk to somebody, feel free to give me a call. Well, I'd be delighted. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. All righty. Have a good day. All righty. Goodbye okay. now. Bye-bye. Well, what is the nicest thing that's ever grown?